I, I had a buddy in town. We actually got in the car, drove up to Chicago to see um, the Cubs play. I was actually in the outfield in the bleachers during that game when they called me and said, hey, we, we drafted you in the 11th round. And I, so I'm sitting there in, in a big league stadium and I got the call and I was like, okay, well, that's, that's cool. Hey, hey, welcome back to the Bullpen Sessions. I am excited for this episode because anytime I get to talk to a former pro baseball player, especially a pitcher, I'm in my element. So I'm excited today to be introducing Tom Masney. We'll call him Mr. Nasty or Nasty Masney. He'll tell you why in a little bit. But uh, Tom is a former professional major league pitcher, relief pitcher, spent a few seasons in the big leagues with the Cleveland Indians. And today, Tom is the founder and owner of The Pennant Group, a health insurance advising uh, firm in Augusta, Georgia. So not only does he speak to my heart as a former pro baseball player, he's also in the same industry I am. So I'm super excited to have him. Tom, welcome aboard. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, get to talk to you. You bet, man. Um, I am going to actually ask a question out of the gate because I always tell people where you're from. You actually have an interesting story. You were not born in the United States. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. It is true. It, uh, I am the only, this is a little trivia question for you, right? Little only Indonesian born uh, Major League Baseball player in the history of the game. So, what's the backstory uh, on that? Yeah, you know, I wish it was more exciting, right? Um, but, you know, my dad at the time was a um, controller for an oil company. Um, he took an overseas assignment. And, you know, they, the company was acquiring, you know, other companies and Indonesia happened to be one of the, one of the places that they, they acquired. Um, so we were over in Borneo, Indonesia, and we were there for, I guess about three years. Um, I lived 18, the first 18 months of my life over there. And um, my older sister was getting to the age where she was going to start school and they just decided that, Hey, Indonesia is probably not the best place to, to raise a family. So they ended up moving back and um, went to Illinois for a, a number of years. And then when I was about five, we moved to Indianapolis, a, you know, a little suburb Zionsville, Indiana, Northwest corner. But uh, so my, my childhood basically, was in Indiana, Indianapolis, but, uh, yeah. So first Indonesian born, uh, major league baseball player. And I think first Indonesian born, um, Japanese, you know, baseball player in their, in their professional league over there. So I've got two we'll, professional. We'll talk around. about that. Cause I know you spent yeah. a little part of your end, end of your career in Japan. Um, so is it safe to say if Indonesia ever gets asked to participate in the world baseball classic, are you going to make a comeback? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think I still got it. I mean, if, if they're if they need a uh, six six out of shape, two hundred and seventy pound person that's throwing seventy five miles an hour, I'm your man. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, it's funny you bring up uh, Zionsville being like a suburb of Indianapolis. My nephew right now is in the midst of high school travel ball, right uh, during the summers, and I know I forget what suburb it is in Indianapolis, but there is a baseball complex there now that is massive. Like the number of fields there blows me away. And they, I know they play there two, three times every summer, but it's Indianapolis is definitely a baseball town. I know Indiana is yeah. known for basketball, but it's definitely a baseball town. Well, you know, you're a guy, you're the kind of guy I don't like Tom, because you know, you were given the, the, the gift of height at six, six, um, being a five, nine pitcher. I always envied guys like you, but when you were growing up in Zionsville, cause at the end of the day, in my research on Zionsville, it's not a huge town. Um, wow. What was it like playing high school baseball in a smaller town where I'm going to guess, and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm going to guess that you were probably this one of the standout athletes. What was that like when you are, you know, literally standing out by height and talent growing up in a smaller town playing for a high school like that? Yeah, I think it was, you know, I was, I was by far a, a late developer, right? So I was not your star athlete in little league. I was not your star, even through high school, it was probably junior senior year of high school is when I actually started to hit my growth spurt. I was, I was five, five as a freshman, um, you know, started growing my junior year. Uh, I think I hit six foot my junior year. And then by the time I graduated, I was six, four. And then after my freshman year of college is when I stopped. So 
I was a late, late bloomer, um, which was probably good for my baseball career because I didn't, I didn't get to pitch a ton. Um, I, I, I had some bullets left in the arm by the time I got to college. So, you know, I graduated, I was throwing 82, 82 to 86 miles an hour, um, and just slowly increased, you know, through my freshman and sophomore year, but it really wasn't until my junior year of college where I figured figured out how to pitch and, um, play the game. But, you know, in a small town, we were a, you know, Indianapolis is known for basketball. So basketball was the number one sport, but football at our school, we were a football powerhouse. Baseball kind of took a back seat. Um, you know, so I was, I, I put up good numbers, but I was overlooked by most of the main mainstream colleges. Um, you know, so it was kind of one of those self-promotion things that I had to do. I don't know. You know, we played around the same time. So recruiting, back then it was a lot different than it was today. I remember sending off VHS tapes to two colleges and, uh, you know, having to go down to the, the winter camps and, and self promote. So, you know, I really had three, three choices out of high school, um, outside of the small, I knew I wanted to go division one just because that's, I, I knew I was good enough. Um, but I wasn't, um, I wasn't so ego driven where I needed to go to a big division one school. Um, I had an opportunity at Butler university, which is in Indianapolis. Um, and I had a special walk on status at Ole Miss. Um, and then everything else was small, but then I somehow lucked into fallen on Furman's graces. So I self promoted myself to Furman just because I had a connection through my pitching coach and uh, their head coach actually grew up in Indiana. So he came up to, to visit and uh, we just hit it off and they actually offered me the best scholarship. Um, and I had an opportunity to contribute my freshman year, which I think is what, what contributed to my growth is actually getting to play and develop and, and learn the game from an early, early standpoint, my freshman year. There's so many symmetries in our career. Um, I have to ask you though, being that, you know, by the time you finished high school, you were six, four, were you, were you also a football and basketball player? No, I, I played, you know, so growing up, I played, uh, I played every sport. Not well. I mean, I was competitive, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, my two sports were actually soccer and baseball. Oh, so, wow. okay. Um, opposite seasons. So, you know, mm-hmm. soccer in the, it, in Indiana, soccer was a fall sport. Mm-hmm. Um, here in Georgia for some reason it's spring, but uh, so I would play soccer in the fall and then dabble in basketball. Um, you know, I, I gave up on basketball in seventh grade when I was short and fat and sat the bench. But uh, so soccer in the fall, baseball in the spring, um, I guess really just a way to stay in shape, but soccer was actually my first love. So I played soccer oh, wow. up through my sophomore year of high school was um, Olympic development program as a kid. So, I mean, I was, I was competitive at soccer, but blew my, blew my ankle out, broke my ankle and tore my hamstring in the same year. And uh, I said, enough is enough. And then my senior year, of course, I started hitting the growth spur. So the soccer team wanted me to be their goalie. The basketball team wanted me to come out and play. And at that point I was, I was dead set on baseball and uh, had some scholarship opportunities and didn't want to, didn't want to risk it. Well, first you grew a foot in high school. Like that's unbelievable. Um, that blows me away that you had that much, that much of a growth spurt. But you know, I, I laugh when I was in seventh grade, I tell people I was the only kid that made the A team in basketball with B cups. I, I, I was a chubby kid as well. <laughs> um, but you know, you talk about the recruiting. I wanted to bring this up for a second. Recruiting back then, 25 years ago, was very different in the Midwest and Great Lakes, right? I was just talking about this with my dad. He's a longtime high school baseball coach. Back then, being a player, being an athlete in Wisconsin, it was a big deal if a kid got recruited to Minnesota or a school right. in the Big Ten. Like that was a big deal out of Wisconsin. Nowadays, Every kid, my dad lists off these kids at these high schools that, you know, this kid's going somewhere in the SEC. This kid's going somewhere in the ACC. And I think this travel ball has completely changed the dynamic. And I also believe it's absolutely killing Big Ten programs because they can't recruit anybody anymore because they're all going to southern schools. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so you're at Furman. So you get you go down to Furman in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. And I know you, you played with a uh, common connection, Dom Franchini. Yeah. Um, 
you talked about your junior year. You learned how to pitch. I want to, I want to focus on this for a second because there's usually that moment for athletes when it clicks. And you talked about in ju- uh, your junior year, you learned how to pitch. I too got a chance to pitch my freshman year, which I think helped. But what do you, when you say I learned how to become a better pitcher, talk about that for a second. Yeah. So, you know, I had 400, uh, over 400 innings my collegiate career. So, I mean, I got almost 100 innings my freshman year. So it was, it wasn't a workload learning to pitch. It was a learning, it was more learning to compete and learning to control my emotions. Um, you know, after my sophomore year, I went and played in the Coastal Plains League, um, which played in Wilson, North Carolina, um, and had an outstanding year. I mean, I, you know, led the league in ERA, most wins, um, you know, was starting to get looked at by a lot of um, pro teams. You know, they were like, okay, so after my sophomore year, going into junior year, going to be draft eligible, um, I was starting to, to pique the interest of these teams. So my, I thought that I was, you know, the next coming at that point. Even though in realization, I went to Furman University, I threw 86 to, to 90 miles an hour. I wasn't the next thing, but my ego kind of got in the way. So my junior year was absolutely terrible, but I learned a lot from that. Sort of, you know, I learned to compete with what I had and that, you know, I'm going to fail. But if I keep putting in the hard work, eventually it's going to pay off. So, you know, my junior year really taught me a lot of self-growth where it was you know, I had high expectations and I didn't meet those expectations. So it was how do I adjust from that to you know, if my dream is to play professional baseball, what it was, I was going to have to step it up and have a lot better senior year um, in order to get that opportunity. So I say it, it taught me how to pitch. It taught me how to pitch with dealing with failure. Yeah. I love that because if you look, if you go back and you look at your junior year and compare it to your senior year, I talk about, you know, it's the work you're putting in when no one's watching. Would right. you say there was definitely a difference between the work you put in off the field between your junior and senior year that led to the very different results? Yeah, it was the focus, right? Yeah. It was, it was, um, in a, in a, in a, and I said two things like one is I went to Furman university, which is a small liberal arts school, 2,600 students, Everybody knows everybody, so you can't get away with much, right? So academically, it kicked my butt. My freshman year, I had to figure out how to actually be a student athlete. Uh, My senior year, I I had a lot of distractions. So baseball was my my competitive release, which was good. I met my wife my senior year. Um, I overloaded in classes, so I took an extra class every semester, and then I had to, you know, be a student athlete on top of that. So I was so busy that I didn't have enough time to get in trouble off the field. Um, the other thing that I did, I made a post on LinkedIn about having a mentor. Um, it was interesting. I had a different pitching coach all four years at Furman. So my first year was Tommy John, the Tommy John. Um, his son was a, a senior when I was there. So Tommy would come down from Charlotte and basically help us. Um, so he taught us a lot about, about pitching in general and just how to, you know, be a student athlete. Then I had a different one my sophomore year and a different one my junior year. And then my senior year, um, we had a pitching coach that was actually an outfielder. And our, my head coach came to me and said, hey, I want you to be basically the pitching coach. So he put a lot of responsibility on me, which made me work harder because I had to lead through example now. So, you know, if, if we wanted the pitching staffs to succeed, I had to be that leader and kind of mold the group and lead by example, which the combination of all of that together made me have a year where I didn't really realize what I was doing as I was doing it. Cause I was just trying to set the example for everybody else. I love that. That was a bold move by the head coach, you know, to put a, an active college player in as quasi pitching coach. Wow. Well, and for you, I know it paid off that that's interesting. Cause you know, you look at your senior year again, I'm, I'm making notes on what I, what I researched, you know, you were the 2003 Southern conference pitcher of the year. I believe you had some all American status as well that year, you know, on different, different lists and stuff like that. So do you believe 
just a quick answer to this question. The fact he put you in that leadership role, did that have a positive impact on those statistical results you had that year? Because I think you went, what, 11 and 2, 12 and 2, something like that on the mound? Yeah, I, it's, you know, I had a, I think I actually had a 109 ERA in like 100. Which is unheard of, by the way. In college baseball with metal bats, that's unheard of. Yeah, it, it was one of those, I, I didn't know what I was doing in the moment because it was, it was my role was to set the example every Friday night for what we were going to do. And I would just take it and, and run with it and, and do it. So I knew I was having a good year, but my goal was to get drafted. And the only, that was my focus is go out, compete as, as hard as I can. Don't worry about the results, but just show kind of my bulldog mentality and everything else will pay off. Um, and luckily it did for me. That's awesome, man. Well, that's kudos to you as a kid. You know, what what were you probably 21 years old, 20, 21 years old to be put in that responsibility to basically run the pitching staff. uh, That's impressive. Not only to be able to run the staff, but then have the season you had, which by the way, led to you. Not only are you in the Furman Hall of Fame, you got drafted that year in the 11th round by the Blue Jays. Yeah. Talk to us quickly about what was it like when you got the call? What was that? You probably remember the moment. What was it like when you got the call that from the Blue Jays saying, hey, Tom, we'd like to draft you? So it was such a surreal experience, right? Like I knew I was going to get drafted, but where, and you've gone through this, where you're going to get drafted is just, uh, you know, you just, you don't really know. So I'd, leading up to it, I'd heard second to, to sixth round. Um, and then I started getting phone calls the day before from scouts saying, Hey, do you even want to play baseball? And I'm like, yeah, I didn't, I I haven't even put together a resume. I mean, I graduated, but I don't know what I want to do. This is all I want to do. And uh, I got phone calls saying, we heard you want to go to med school. And one person said, Hey, we, we heard you're going to like, you want to be an uh, engineer, like an astrophysicist engineer. I'm like, Whoa, Whoa. Like, no, I'm a business administration major at Furman university um, no. So I think there were some games being played. Um, so I didn't get the first five rounds go by and I just said, you know what? I don't care about this. I, I had a buddy in town. We actually got in the car, drove up to Chicago to see, um, the Cubs play. And that was a Sammy Sosa cork bat game. Mm. I don't know if you remember that, mm-hmm. but that, he you know, broke his bat and got found with cork in there. I was actually in the outfield in the bleachers during that game when they called me. And said, "Hey, you, we we drafted you in the eleventh round." And I, so I'm sitting there in in a big league stadium, and I got the call, and I was like, "Okay, well that's that's cool, right?" So that's then we started awesome. negotiating, and uh, they offered me eight thousand dollars. I asked for ten, and my student loans paid for. They said, "How about eight thousand dollars, or you just don't play?" <laughs> I said, "I'll see you tomorrow." Right. Well, the only thing I think they would have made that better if it was the Chicago Cubs who have drafted you while you were sitting in Wrigley Field. But uh, right, right. that's awesome. Well, a couple of things I want to ask you, because obviously then you have a, a minor league baseball journey, which ultimately mm-hmm. leads you to making your MLB debut in uh, 2006. Yep. Now, I might not have this right, so feel free to correct me. But, you know, my whole career up until minor league baseball as a starting pitcher, and then I got to minor league baseball and I became a reliever, which was a big time adjustment. Yeah. Were you still starting in minor leagues or did you too get moved to the bullpen once you went into pro baseball? No, I, I was a starter. Okay. So um, I started in short season. I started the, the full season in short season a, and then the whole next year I went to low a um, started, made the all-star team. I think I led the league in ERA that year. Um, but I played the whole year in low A and, and, you know, so in my mind, I was like, I'm leading the league in every statistical category. Why am I still in low A? Right. Um, but again, senior, senior sign, no money given to me. I'm just going to have to prove myself. And there's people, as you, as you know, when you get into pro ball, there's a pecking order. There's a business. Yeah. <laughs> It is a business. It's a business. That took me a long time to figure that out. But um, so it was after that year, I actually got traded in the off season uh, for John McDonald, who's uh, kind of a utility infielder. And I was the player to be named later. Um, but I was actually proctoring 
a test. So in the off season, as you make no money in the minor leagues, you find these odd jobs. And I was proctoring a test. Uh, so I, th- I think it was actually an insurance test of all things, but I was the guy that just, yeah, that's sure an eerie that, foreshadow of your future know, career. <laughs> but I got the call from our, uh, the GM, uh, or the player development of the blue Jays. And he says, Hey, thank you for everything. I thought I was getting released. I was like, this is ridiculous. And he said, thank you for everything. You've been traded you'll get a phone call from the Indians. And that was it. That was the, the whole call. So I'm sitting there proctoring a test, don't know anything. And uh, three hours later, the Indians called me and kind of told me what was going on. So, um, but long story, I'll wrap it up as a, uh, I started the next year in high A, but they came to us, they had traded for another, another starter and they didn't know what they wanted. Um, two of us to do. So they put both of us in the bullpen and we would alternate starts. So he would get a start and I would get a start the next week. Um, I had a really good year in the bullpen and they moved me to double a um, for the playoffs. And our director of player development at the time was a guy named John Farrell. I don't know if you know, Johnny coached, uh, had a real successful coaching career later on, but came to me and said, all right, we want to make you a starter again. So it's mid, you know, two weeks into the year, this was 2006. He's like, we want to make you a starter again. Um, what are your thoughts? And I asked him point blank. I said, well, if you were me, would you go back to being a starter? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, what's my fastest way to the big leagues? Is it in the bullpen or is a starter? Cause my, my, I don't care what I do. I want to be in the big leagues. And he says, well, if that's your goal, then you want to be a a reliever. And I said, well, keep me in the bullpen. And then six weeks later, basically I was in the, in the big leagues. Um, So, you know, I kind of, and it's just been a testament of what I've, I've done. I I just like to take things in my own hands and maybe it's a control freak in me, but it's really, you control your own destiny and you know what uh, you have to accomplish as long as you know where the guidelines are, then you can go ahead and do it. No, that's cool to hear, man. Cause I'll be honest as someone who did not take control of their own destiny in pro baseball. That's uh, it's, it's uh, cool to hear that you said, Nope, this is the route I want to go. Cause I know what my future is. Quick question on the whole bo- relieving starting. Cause I know for me, I'm a, I'm a creature of habit. So I had a whole routine before I'd start. And then now you're in the middle relief, right? I was middle relief. That, that habit, that ritual, that routine prior to getting out on the mound, literally gets compressed 90% of the, by 90%. Cause in some cases you're up, for, you're, you're, you're from up the bullpen to start warming up into the game in minutes. In some cases, yeah. was that tough for you to make that adjustment at first because you had been so used to being a starting pitcher or no? It, not really. Um, I suffer paralysis by analysis, right? So I, I suffer a little bit from anxiety. So I think if I, would have known that I was pitching that day as a bullpen guy, that it would have messed with me, but being not, being not a priority guy is what they would call. Cause they didn't have a lot of money invested in me that it was a, you get your opportunity when you get your opportunity and knowing that I always had to be ready um, allowed me to create a routine that put me in a position to be ready. Right. So my routine stayed the same pregame, right. Got to the field the same time, did the same, you know, exercises and workout and got myself ready so that when I was called on, I knew that within five minutes, you know, I could be ready to go. Um, you know, it, it, you just have to learn to adapt. It took me a little bit of time, but you know, not a whole lot. I was kind of one of those, just don't, just don't tell me the, the end result. Just let me go do it and figure it out. And, you know, just tell me what your expectations are and let me figure out my own routine. I like that. Um, so you got called up. Did you get called up to the big leagues from double a? No, I actually, um, six weeks in triple a or yes, maybe two, two weeks or three weeks in double a six weeks in triple a. And then what was that like getting the call, getting the notice say, Hey, you're going up, you're going up to the Indians. You know, it was funny. I I was, I was super pumped. I didn't see it coming. I knew I was having a good year. I mean, I guess oblivious, but, uh, it's having a good year and everybody was, you know, saying that, I should get an opportunity, but I wasn't a 40 man guy. So it was like, they had to make room on the 40 man and, and call me up. Um, but I remember we were in Buffalo. Tori Lavolo was the the manager at the time. 
Scott Radinsky was the pitching coach. Um, they called me in after after the game and basically told me that I was going up the next day. And uh, yeah, I immediately call my wife. She doesn't answer. Right? <laughs> she's studying. She's studying for the bar, so she's not in any. She you just I love her to death. Seventeen years, but the studying for the bar was the worst time of our lives. I mean, it was <laughs> miserable. Um, but I call her, she doesn't answer. I call my parents, they don't answer. You have nobody to tell. My, I call my agent, he doesn't answer. I'm like, well, this is great. <laughs> but the biggest day of my life, I'm super pumped. Just want to tell somebody and nobody cares. Right? Nobody, <laughs> nobody answers. But uh, yeah, well, it, was, it was a really cool moment. Well, let's talk about this. And before we get to a really cool moment in your career, I want to talk about something you mentioned offline. Because again, I, in doing my research, uh, behind your, your career, it did say that you, you, uh, had the nickname of Mr. Nasty and you had told the story offline that I'd love you to share about how that nickname came about. And it really happened in your rookie season as you're, uh, uh, in 2006. So talk about that for a second. How the heck did Mr. Nasty come about? Yeah. You know, and it's, it's funny is that is what people still call me. I guess they, when they find out that, you know, I pitch in the big leagues, they immediately look me up and my Wikipedia page comes up and uh, they call me nasty. And I'm like, listen, that is so far outside of my personality. Like I'm, I'm boring. Uh, you know, I'm clean. You know, it's just, it's it just, it, it's just weird. But, you think uh, of Mitch Williams, not Tom yeah. Nasty. <laughs> yeah. You think of somebody walk in and there's just like clothes strewn everywhere, papers everywhere, just, you know, haven't brushed your teeth in a week. And then, it's just, it, I'm just a boring, simple individual, but, um, you know, so we were in, it was 2006, we were in Tampa and, uh, you know, my wife's sorority sisters, there's probably five or six of them at the game and, you know, it's Tampa. So like I told you, there's probably 10 people at the game and five or six of them happen to be my wife's sorority sisters. And I've been up maybe, maybe a month at the time gotten a handful of innings, maybe 10 innings under my belt. And uh, we're going through a, a time where we just could not get the last out of a game. Like we just couldn't close, close a game. So I'm sitting there in the bullpen and my wife's 40 sisters are literally right behind the bullpen uh, in the, in the stand holding sign, you know, poster boards. Like we want nasty, mask me, put nasty, mask me in. And I've never been called that. So I don't know who came up with it, but of course they get it on camera, they get it on film. And that's the, the series where I think I had my first save and maybe had two more, but he ended up, we go back to Cleveland and it's team picture day. And, you know, I walk out of the, out of the bullpen and on the big jumbotron and Cleveland at the time, now all the stadiums have, they had like the LED lights that go along the outfield wall and just everywhere. So they had this like video montage saying nasty, nasty and created like this an intro of me coming on and just, it was just way over the top. And of course all the guys are laughing and I'm just like, this is so embarrassing. Like I'm an introvert. I suffer from anxiety. Like just, I don't want to be the center of attention and you guys have just completely made me that. So you know, it, it completely doesn't go with my personality, but it's it stuck. And it's, uh, you know, I, I've embraced it a little bit, but it's still. And, and that's what play. actually makes it the best nickname, because when the people meet you, you are anything but nasty. So it's, it's <laughs> that's awesome. Well, you know, that's... my stuff, my, my stuff was average at best, right? <laughs> my stuff, I didn't have nasty stuff. It's just, it just doesn't yeah. fit. Well, but so talk about fine. taking, taking advantage of an opportunity. You, you, you said it. I love how you said it. I was pitching at a time. Cleveland could not get a last out. He, they could not get somebody in the game to get the last out. You took, you took advantage of that opportunity. It's awesome. Yeah. So yeah. I want to fast forward and set up this moment because it's 2007. Now you guys are in the American league championship series against Boston. Oh. You're in Fenway park game two. And I believe the game's tied. You're in the bullpen and the baseball fans listening in are going to geek out about this because I want to set the stage here. You're called into the bottom of the tenth to face Manny Ramirez, David Ortiz, and Mike Lowell. So if you're not a baseball fan, let me just quickly give you a little background. Manny Ramirez, 
was an all-star that year, hit 312 for his career and 555 home runs. Dave, David Ortiz hit 286 for his career, 541 home runs for his career. And Mike Lowell hit 324 that year. And all three of them were in the all-star game that year. And here you've got to come in in the bottom of the 10th and continue, extend the game into the 11th inning. What was that moment like? Because you said you're a guy who deals with anxiety. Like, what is that moment like when you're called in a situation like that? Well, first of all, it was, it, it happened by default, right? We'd gone through so many pitchers that I was the, the next guy up, but you know, it was uh, 30 degrees out. It was freezing. So I couldn't feel any of that. My extremities, I hadn't pitched in two weeks because I was, I barely made the playoff roster, but you know, we were sitting out there and I saw that hey, there were two righties, two righties and a lefty coming up. And it was me, Joe Borowski, and Aaron Fultz, the only three guys left in the bullpen. And I knew that Borowski wasn't going to go in because he was our closer. And I knew that Fultz wasn't going to go in because we were there were, you know, two righties coming up. So I said, well, as soon as the phone rang, I knew that it was me. So I just started, well, you know, I, I'm not going to cuss, but it's like uh, a bunch of cuss words went off in my head. <laughs> And I basically just told the coach, I'm ready. You know, like <laughs> I didn't even warm up. I said, I'm ready. Let's, let's, let's go. So, um, you know, I, I don't really remember warming up. I remember the crowd just being really loud, you know, just getting on me while I was warming up. I don't know where the balls went when I was, it was, you know, it was just a really cool, surreal atmosphere that you're running out and it's just noise. Right. So I tell everybody that I'd rather pitch in front of 60, 70,000 people than the 10 people in Tampa any day of the week, because you just can't hear anything. Um, but I just I just knew that, hey, I got a job to do. Um, can't be too fine because I hadn't pitched in two weeks. So I was just like, let's just let's just let it eat and uh, see what happens. And, you know, luckily, uh, luckily I got out of it. Umpire squeezed me a couple. I've, you know, gone back and watched the video and he was definitely a tight zone. So the balls that I was having to pitch were right down the middle. People were like, oh, you struck them all out. I was like, no, I gave up a missile to the second baseman at our shortstop having to be in a shift, hit him in the chest. And it, Ortiz just being Ortiz wasn't running hard. So we got him out. And then Manny and Lowell just got under it and popped it up. But uh, I remember running off the mound. We scored six runs. I looked at Wedge and I said, I'm done, right? Like, I don't have to go back out there. And he's like, you are absolutely done. Like, we're not going to ask you to go back out. <laughs> and you got the win. Got the win. I got the baseball up there. I mean, it's uh, pretty cool. Moment. That, that's a, like I said, man, I, I'm impressed being a guy that is admittedly said deals with anxiety in unideal conditions. You're asked to go out and face, you know, two future hall of famers for sure. Yeah. Um, and, and you, you get, you know, you get them out in order that that's impressive. I mean, I'm going to say it, the pair of balls that takes to do that, man, is, is unbelievable. Especially when you're just in your second year, uh, you're probably not even your second full year yet of playing at the big leagues to be able to go out and do that, man. That's, that's phenomenal. Um, before I get into some follow-up questions, I want to ask you one last thing about the baseball career. Cause at the end you ended up finishing your career in Japan. Yep. You went over and signed a contract with the uh, Yokohama Bay Stars. What was that like? Because I, for the folks who may not know, like what is playing in the Japanese professional league feel like compared to playing in Major League Baseball? It's it's very similar, um, you know, from an atmosphere standpoint and a quality of baseball. Obviously, they you know they won the WBC this year. Um, the quality of baseball is outstanding over there. Um, you, the difference. Uh, the difference are the nuances, right? Like the travel over here is better. Um, they take care of the players a little bit better over here. Just, you know, five-star accommodations over there. You're roughing it just a hair of it here more. Um, the tough part over there is just the language barrier and the cultural differences. It just being able to communicate on a daily basis uh, is a struggle. Um understanding what their expectations are just because of the disconnect of the, the communication is, is tough, but the actual game itself is very similar. Um, I'd say it's more technically sound over there. It's, it's, 
as what we would call it's real baseball, right? It's small ball. It's bunt, you bunt, you steal. Um, the, the fields are a little bit smaller, so the home run comes into play a little bit more often. And the games, I'd actually say it's a faster game because the fields are either skinned in fields or turf. So there's very little grass over there. So it's a, it's a faster game um, with more technical skill. But, um, you know, it definitely wasn't a step down in competition for me. It, uh, you know, it made me a better baseball player, even though they kicked my butt. Like it was a, I was on my, I was on my way out um, in my baseball career. Mentally, I think I was just kind of burnt out and uh, I struggled over there. I struggled uh, from a, you know, mental side of baseball, I, I didn't pitch well, but then I struggled just emotionally, just being half a world away from my wife and, and daughter and, uh, you know, not being able to see them and just not being able to communicate with people. It just didn't fit my personality, but it was a great, great experience looking back on it. it made me get outside my comfort zone and made me grow as an individual. Yeah. Well, you know, wrapping up here, uh, uh you know, looking fa fast forwarding now beyond the baseball career, because I won't make you go through your whole business career, but here you are today. You opened the pennant group, I think in 2021, uh, yep. with as a health insurance advising firm in Augusta, Georgia. Um, you're fresh off, as you said, the, uh, master's hangover. We are recording this on Monday, April 10th. So, yeah. um, when you look back at your baseball career and what you're doing today from, you know, from the health insurance advising perspective, I tell people in our industry, you know, you have one of the most important jobs in America because you help keep businesses doors open. You can help keep somebody out of medical bankruptcy. You know, you can help save somebody's life, quite frankly, if you provide the right kind of coverage. Right. I don't I don't think mm -hmm. I don't think enough advisors in our industry understand the magnitude of their job. But when you look at that role, just like the role of a relief pitcher, like when you look back at your baseball career, what what mental aspects of your athletic career do you still deploy today to help you run the Penny Group? Yeah, I don't know if I've ever uh, looked at it that way. Um, I, I think I, the biggest thing for me is to be an extension of their team, right? So, you know, me being a playing baseball and having the team aspect you know, I look at the consulting side as I'm just a member of their team trying to help them achieve whatever goal they're trying to achieve. Right. And, and health insurance employee benefits as a whole have become a top two or three line item on a budgetary expense. So, you know, if our ultimate goal is to retract, attract and retain these employees and this is a top line budget line item. How do I help them achieve that their ultimate goal? So, you know, I haven't looked at like the role, the importance of what I do from a um, from a providing of the insurance and how we can potentially save somebody's life or give that give somebody access to medication that they can't afford and and get creative on a cost containment solution. But it's really just rolling up my sleeves, being a team player and addressing a, a problem and trying to solve it with them uh, from their side of the table. So, you know, I think the, the mental aspect of sports is what has been able to allow me to succeed of, you know, listen, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be tough. You know, tell me what the, the guidelines are and then let us figure out how to solve that problem and uh, achieve your ultimate goal. You, admit, you reminded me, uh, my pitching coach in college was a guy named Todd Froworth, uh, who also pitched in the major submarine pitcher in the major leagues. And I remember him saying he, one of the analogy or one of the themes was always as a starting pitcher, give up sticks, don't give up crooked numbers. So if you're going to give up any runs, keep it to one, keep it to one run yeah. and inning. Don't give up crooked numbers. And I, I think it's kind of the same way with, with what you do as an advisor, right? Like your job is cost is one of the biggest problems in healthcare and health insurance today. It's almost like your job is to keep it to the sticks. Give up, don't give up the crooked numbers and you're helping businesses uh, really make sure they're not giving up quote unquote runs, you know, that, those exceeding right. those costs that are continuing to have a huge impact on their business. And so, you know, I think one of the things too, Tom is like, when I look back, when I find myself in pressure moments in business, I always go back like to my pro career, remembering those times I was called into the game second and third with one out. And my job was to get out of the jam. Mm -hmm. And go, okay, what did I, what did I do when I was on the mound in that moment? And how can I apply that mentality today? And I think that's why athletes, I don't want to say they have an advantage, but this is why they often are successful is because when they're put in those pressure moments, 
they can go back to those moments on the field when they were in that pressure moment and they had to stand step up just like you did, especially in the ALCS. Um, and I think that's what helps a lot of those former athletes over, you know, stand out in those critical moments. Yeah. I think it's, we also deal with failure, right? Like yep. if you're in sports or you're an athlete in general, you're going to fail, right? Like you're playing a game, you're either going to win or you're going to lose. So you have to learn how to deal with failure. And I think that's part of ultimately what keeps people from succeeding in the big leagues, right? I think 5% of people that get drafted and make it to the big leagues and then 5% stay five plus years. I honestly, I didn't make it the five plus years because when I hit failure, I was immature enough. I didn't know how to deal with the, the failure, right? I tried to mentally dig out of it and put too much pressure on myself. So I think knowing how to deal with failure has helped me succeed in business and has helped you succeed in business that listen, at the end of the day, it's not the end of the world, right? Like there's a bigger, bigger theme we're all striving for here, but you know, we're going to, and I tell my clients this, that as long as we have data and we can make educated decisions based off of that data, right? We can pick a path to go down. And most of the time it's going to be a good path, but every now and then we'll make a decision that looks like it's right. And it may turn out to be incorrect, but we need to know what that game plan is to flip it when we make that decision. That's a failure. And if, as long as you know what that could potentially look like going into it. You're going to succeed on the backside because you yeah, know that, how to deal with it. That's well said. You know, when I look at a lot of advisors with with closing ratios, right, they get frustrated when they go one for two or or one for three, and it's like Hall of Fame batters barely went three for ten. And when people struggle with that ment ment mentality of going three for ten, my answer is typically you just don't have enough sales opportunities. How many opportunities are you creating for yourself where three for 10 is going to be just fine because you have enough opportunity. If you don't have any opportunities, you're desperately trying to go one for two, sometimes even two for two. But right. if the more opportunity you create, the easier it's going to be to go three for 10 and still succeed and, and, and be absolutely okay with that failure. So last question, and then I'll let you wrap. Um, and it's yeah. the most cliche question I ask everybody, but I'm going to ask it anyways. If you could go back and talk to senior Tom Masney at Zionsville high school, knowing what you know today, being through, having gone through everything you've gone through from playing in the minors, college minors, pro MLB, Japan. Now you're running an insurance agency in Augusta, Georgia. What advice would you give that 18 year old version of Tom? I would just tell him to just relax, right? Relax and enjoy it. I think, uh, we, I still do this today, but we, we put so much pressure on ourselves to impress other people and to make sure that we are, um, either well-liked or we're popular, right? Like I'm on social media, but I don't participate in social media, right? Like I just, I don't care at this point. Um, so I think, I think if I could go back, it would just tell myself that it's going to be all right. You don't, you don't need to try and fit in, just be yourself and be okay being yourself. Like be, be the introvert. Like I'm okay being an introvert now. I don't have to, I, I'll, you know, it's, it's, it's weird as people, sometimes there's meetings and I don't say a word. And then after the word, the meeting, people are like, well, you didn't say anything. Well, I didn't have to, right? Like it's okay to just be who you are, but if you relax and just enjoy the process that you're going through um, and don't get too high, don't get too low, it's all going to work out in the end, but just to uh, relax and don't put the pressure yeah, on yourself. I, that's adv good advice for me. I too am an introvert. And I know there's moments I have to be an extrovert to help grow the business, but at the end of the day, just be who you are. I mean, that's our whole message as, as complete game consulting, build the brand of you, put you in your right. prospecting and everything will work out. And so I love that. Well, Tom, if somebody was inspired by what they heard today and just wanted to reach out to you, what are the easiest ways to get a hold of you? Yeah, we obviously you can go, you can look me up on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. It does um, not say nasty, nasty, nasty. Not, not yet. I mean, I may put it, I may, <laughs> you know, I may discover another one after this. Um, no, I mean, Tom Massey, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, you know, my, my company's website is the pennant group.com. Pretty simple. Um, my email address is Tom at the pennant group.com. It's pretty easy to find Perfect. too. So, I mean, I, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. Um, you know, I'd love to, to hear other people's stories. My biggest, my biggest thing is I just want to know who you are, right? So if somebody reaches out to me, I, I, like everybody else in business, I want to do business with people that I know and that I get along with. 
Um, so, you know, what you're doing and bringing, bringing us to the fore, forefront is, is invaluable because I think a lot of people, and it's not to pat myself on the back, but a lot of people think that former athletes or professional athletes are, are kind of um, hard to get a hold of and difficult to deal with and because they've got an ego. And at the end of the day, it's the complete opposite. You know, for me, it's I, I'd rather somebody reach out to me than me have to knock on somebody else's door, which I don't feel comfortable doing. So it's, uh, you know, if somebody wants to get a hold of me, just track me down, reach out to me and I'll respond. Yeah, no, I love how you said that. That's exactly what we we stand for is, you know, just be you, put you in your prospecting, but at the same time, um, don't put so much pressure on, on succeeding. Just let it come be you. And, and I'm going to answer a question for people just because I know they might ask, no, Tom cannot give you, get you on Augusta because he lives in Augusta, Georgia. <laughs> so no, all the, I've been there a couple of times just to watch, but every year I get new shirts is because people give them to me or I buy them from people. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Can't get well, you out there. We can get on some other nice golf courses. Well, Tom, nice. I want to thank you. It's been an awesome conversation. I really enjoyed this. And I think a lot of people are going to enjoy it too. So for everybody else listening in, I hope you took, took, uh, notes and listen to what Tom had to say, uh, from, you know, as he said, just because he's a pro athlete doesn't mean he's, uh, untouchable, unapproachable. He has the same mental battles as you do, but it's, it's what you do in between the lines to overcome them. That's going to help you have success. And as the, uh, purpose of this podcast is to give you clarity and confidence because when you have both you feel unstoppable so go do amazing things today